Well, good morning to you. It's good to see you. Thank you for making this a priority in your week. Is it just me or is it humid in here? It's good to worship the Lord in Alabama, isn't it? Thank you for being a part of uh, the weekend together, church fam. It's always a blessing to be with you. Guests, thanks for coming in and being with us. I don't know how you've come or what brought you, but uh, we've been praying for you. We've been praying that God would meet you in a significant way. If you know Jesus as your Savior, that you would be strengthened in your faith. And if you don't, that you'd meet him here with us. And uh, he's changed our lives. And we're so thankful that you're with us today. If you're joining in online, welcome to you as well. Uh, thankful for uh, the opportunity to have that way of participating with us. If you are away from us, somewhere else that is, I'm assuming, cooler than here, uh, thank you for making Christ a priority in your vacation time. I hope that you're rested well, and we look forward to the reunion very soon when you're back in town. If you're a guest kicking the tires uh, that way, uh, thank you for doing that. I hope it'll lead you to meet with us. There's nothing like being among the people in the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you desperately want to be with us because you're part of our family, but sickness or circumstances are keeping you away, uh, we love you. Your absence is not missed on us. We are praying for you, and uh, we care deeply for you. We are eager for the reunion, but thankful that we get this opportunity to at least be involved in the same moment together in God's word. And if you're a part of our church family and you're just in your jammies and deciding not to be here, Turn it off, go get a shower, we'll see you at noon, okay? (laughs) Consider carefully Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and we'll see you later today. All right, let's grab our Bibles. You got Bibles with you? I hope you do. Guest, if you didn't bring a Bible with you or don't have it on your device, you can grab our copy of the Bible. It should be underneath of a seat nearby, a little black hardback copy, and uh, we're going to dive into that in just a moment. We're kicking off a series together this summer uh, called Saints and Suffering, which is a real uh, burden on my heart. To be honest with you, uh, pastorally, suffering comes in waves, it seems, in our church family. And uh, in this last wave of suffering, in various ways, the experiences of our church family really have led me to a concern for my own soul and for our souls collectively to have a, a theology of suffering that bolsters us for suffering, carries us through suffering, and turns glory to God as we come out of seasons of suffering. So uh, this is truly my desire. I don't know if you've come in with suffering on you and in you, or whether this week is the beginning of the dark days. You and I don't know what's coming. We don't have any knowledge of the future, but perhaps this is the beginning of the dark days. Or perhaps you are coming out of the darkest of the times of your life and you are in the recovery out of those intense crucibles of suffering. Whatever the case, week in and week out as we gather together, we're going to have passage after passage after passage of God's truth. It's full of hope for those dark days to prepare us, to establish us in them, to shape and mold us as we walk through them and come out of the other side of those seasons. So I pray that God will use this and uh, minister to you and minister to me uh, as we walk through this together as a church family. Someone, no doubt, said it first. I don't know who it was, and it gets colloquialized everywhere, but Charles Spurgeon gets credited with this line because it was a part of a famous sermon that he preached. Quote, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Do you know that phrase or do you know a form of that phrase? I grew up with snow being put in for the wax. That's just because I lived after the Industrial Revolution where my house was not made up of candles. And yet the same context uh, holds no matter what the colloquialism of the expression is. What Spurgeon is addressing there for the saints that were listening to him is that there are certain aspects of life that come to everyone, but everyone's response to them and the outcome of those experiences is not the same. And I would propose to you this morning that suffering is one such topic. Suffering is the inescapable reality for all of humanity and all of God's people. And yet, the shared experience, the common experience of suffering does not result in the same outcome or response 
in all of God's people. So my desire for us as we engage in this study, as we kick it off today, is that through God's word and the spirit of God working among us, there will be not just the shared experience of suffering, which is our shared experience, but that there will be a shared outcome of suffering. We will rejoice to see the same things happening in each other through suffering because God's word is renewing our minds and reviving our hearts and recalibrating our faith and establishing us, anchoring us, passage after passage after passage. So to begin our time, I want to go to the one who seems to know the most in our New Testament about suffering, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. And I would invite you to grab that Bible and open it up to a crown jewel chapter of our Bible, Romans chapter number eight. Let's start there in Romans chapter eight. And if you're borrowing our copy of the Bible uh, and you're unfamiliar with it, that's totally fine. Just go to the front cover there. There, There's a list of the books of the Bible. You'll see Romans, as in Rome, Italy. Romans, and uh, there'll be a page number there. Turn to that page number and look for the big number eight big block number eight, and you can meet us there. I'll show you the little number in just a moment. And if you are borrowing that but don't own a Bible, don't borrow, keep. Uh, Take it with you. We'll replace it after service. We'd love for you to have God's word in your life beyond today. We're going to call our study When Suffering Strikes. The Apostle Paul has an entirely different worldview than is normal in his time or in any time. He's writing this in the middle of the first century, and yet it continues to be the pursuit and the outcome of all of God's people who engage with Paul's thinking and theology that God results, brings these results together for all of us. So here we are all the way in 2024 with all the same confidence that God can do in us and through us what God was doing in Paul and through Paul. He's writing it from Corinth to the church at Rome. He wants to get there, but he hasn't been there yet. And this really is his masterpiece theologically. The book of Romans, the letter of the Romans, is his magnum opus. He wrote to ensure that the believers at Rome and the Spirit of God, through the preservation of the word that he inspired, intends for us as well to be established in the saving work As sinners, God saves us. And as sinners who have been saved, God sanctifies us. And as sinners who have been saved and are being sanctified, God calls us into the mission of the work that he is doing around the world to bring many from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And as those who have been sinners who have been saved and who are being sanctified and who are on the glorious mission of God for the salvation of other sinners, we are to be a people who live uniquely as his people. Those are the segments of Romans 1 through 4, chapter 5 through 8, chapter 9 through 11, and chapter 12 through 16. So today we come to chapter 8, which really is dealing with the constant battle in our lives to be shaped and molded into the image of Christ. And the reality of chapter 8 is that it is permeated with the expectation and the experience of suffering. So perhaps you have been led to believe that following Jesus would be the end of suffering and the beginning of a good life. Oh, it is the beginning of a good life, but it is not the end of suffering. No, that day will come, and the Apostle Paul is addressing the believers who are living in the real world, in the real time, and with real suffering. So I'm going to deliver to you just one verse. We're going to read one verse. Christchurch family, can you believe that? One verse. One verse. I'm going to read it twice because I can't just read one verse and be done. That seems too short. So give your full attention to verse 18, right in the middle of chapter 8. And remember as we read, these are God's words for us this morning. The Apostle Paul, under the superintending ministry of the Spirit, says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Let's read it one more time. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. These are God's words for us this morning. May the Spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten by them. Here's the big idea. Here's the whole sermon in a sentence, and really this is the kickoff of the whole series. How we relate to suffering... 
Paul's relating to suffering in verse 18. How we relate to suffering determines how we are reshaped by suffering. The common experience will be suffering. Might be a lot of suffering, might be a little bit of suffering, it'll be suffering. Might be particularly heavy suffering or what seems to be insignificant suffering, it will be suffering. Might be third world suffering or first world suffering which seems to have some distinction in our appraisal, and yet it will be suffering. God's people everywhere will suffer. But how we relate to that suffering is the determining factor of how that suffering reshapes us as we live through it and walk with Christ in it. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. This one sentence is a declaration of his relationship to suffering. And I believe there's opportunity here for us to be renewed in our mind and to be recalibrated for our own experiences of suffering if they are here today or if they come tomorrow or if they have just seemingly slowed down from yesterday. The question I want us to consider is how should we relate through the example of the Apostle Paul with the clarity that he provides for us in verse 18. And there are three relational connections that come out of his sentence. One sentence, he does not consider the sufferings of this present time to be worth comparing to the, with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What is going on in that sentence? There are three relational connections that he exposes us to. He plays his hand. He shows us what he has when it comes to his own relationship to sufferings. And I'll show them to you. So if you're jotting them down, I hope you will, or put them in your note app, whatever you're doing. Here's how we'll do it. When suffering strikes, these are the three relational connections that will ground us and guard us. Number one, when suffering strikes, you ready? Number one, consider it theologically. Consider it theologically. That will not be our first instinct, apart from the Spirit of God aiding us in suffering. We will feel first. We will emote first. We will have all the sensation of the suffering first. But the Apostle Paul lays out his relationship begins with thinking. He thinks, he believes, he's convinced of certain realities that lead him to say that this suffering in this present time is not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed to us. How did he get there? And I want to take you back to begin with the first word. (laughs) I'm only preaching one verse. We're going to go word for word. I want to start with the word for. That word for is important. It's not a throwaway. He's continuing an argument. Paul's continuing an argument. And what he says, he considers, which is just the word where we get the word logic, he thinks. The way he thinks is is connected to that word for because that's connected to what he's already said. I don't know if you remember this, but Paul did not write in chapters and verses. He did not write to verse 17 and then write the number 18 down on the page and just be like, man, I don't know what to say next. Went to the coffee shop. He's like, I got writer's block. I've got eight chapters done, but I cannot figure out verse 18. That's not what, this is a letter. He's got a flow of logic. He's just moving right through it. And it's leading him to think things that are not normal. He thinks that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. How did he get there? It's in verse 16 and verse 17. Notice the theology that's underneath of, over top of, and all through Paul's experience and relationship with suffering. He says in verse 16, you see it? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Here's the theology of the Apostle Paul. Here's what four is coming out of, okay? Verse 18 is coming out of verse 16 and 17. It's flowing out of it. How could he think the way he thinks about his suffering? Because he believes what he believes in verse 16 and 18, 16 and 17. And what he believes is that the Spirit of God is in him. As a gift of the new covenant, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, every single one of us. Amen? Amen. The Spirit of God is in him. He is not alone in his sufferings. 
Second theological truth is that he is a child of God. He is an adopted child of God, fully adopted into the family of God. You are a son or a daughter of God if, in fact, you have placed your faith in Christ, which means theologically that your suffering is not God forgetting about you or punishing you. No. The Spirit of God is in you testifying that you are a child of God, loved by God, eternally loved. You cannot be plucked out of his hand. His heart is towards you. He loved you so much that he sent his son for you. Theologically, you are not just a son or a daughter. The apostle Paul is convinced he's an heir. Because he's a child of God, he's an heir of the inheritance of God with Jesus. Theologically, something is set aside, the inheritance. It's set aside in heaven. It cannot be touched. It will not be ruined. It cannot be stolen. No one can get to it. It is the privilege of all of those who are in Christ. But the last part of verse 17 does not make it on coffee mugs and doesn't hang in anybody's house that I'm aware of in a frame. You can hunt Hobby Lobby high and low. You won't find this verse in there. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. With him as with Christ. In other words, what the Apostle Paul says theologically is that suffering is not an outlier. It's not the exception. What he believes as he thinks that his suffering is not worth comparing to the glory, what's behind that is a theology. It's a theology because he's indwelt by the Spirit in the new covenant privilege. He has placed his faith in Christ, therefore he is adopted into the family of God. And as a child of God, he is an heir with Christ, the inheritance of Christ, and the way, the plan of God for his life. The plan of God for our lives is to suffer with Jesus until we're glorified with Jesus. That's the plan he has for us. That's not a tweet you see very often, is it? God has a great plan for your life, that you would suffer with Christ and then be glorified with Christ. And yet that's exactly the theological grid through which Paul lives. So he thinks the way he thinks. And don't misunderstand when he says, for I consider... That's not him saying he has an opinion. That's not saying that this is his angle and you have your angle. This is a conviction word. This is a settled word. He sees it this way because it's true. So loved ones, I would implore you to consider your suffering theologically. You will still suffer. But if you do not consider it theologically, if the gospel does not inform the lens through which you look at your suffering, you likely will miss out on the privileges that come to those who are suffering. In fact, Romans chapter 8 has got a bunch of them in it. And I'm still struggling with preaching one verse, so I'm just going to read all the other verses. You got your Bible open? I want you to see them. Look at verse 25 and 26. Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings too deep for words. The theology of Paul builds to this moment with confidence that when he is in the midst of his suffering, When the phone drops to the floor, when the gut punch comes, when we close the car door and the job is gone, when the diagnosis is that it's back, and all we can do is groan, the theology of Paul leads to the confidence that the Spirit of God in the people of God can interpret groans and make them into prayers. That's what he does. Not only that, he goes further. Look down at verse 28. This one does make it on the coffee mugs. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to suffer with him, and to be glorified with him, in order that he might, that is, Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers who all have the same story, suffering glory, suffering glory, his cross, his throne, our suffering, and then in his presence, our glory. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, declared righteous. And those whom he justified, it says, good as done, he also glorified. Don't miss the precious privileges of considering your sufferings theologically. You're not alone. The Spirit is with you. God has not forsaken you. You are one of his children You have not been neglected. You are a co-heir with Jesus. And the plan was always suffering to glory. That was always the plan. So then the Spirit will meet you and interpret the groans in the suffering. And God will be at work through the suffering to accomplish his good purposes. We reference it a lot. It's called the Gospel Primer, written by Milton Vincent. And he says it this way, quote, The good news of the gospel about my trials or about my sufferings is that God is forcing them to bow to his gospel purposes and do good unto me by improving my character and making me more conformed to the image of Christ. Preaching the gospel to myself each day provides a lens through which I can view my trials in this way and see the true cause for rejoicing that exists in them. I can then embrace trials as friends and allow them to do God's good work in me, end quote. See, this is not normal. This is the way of the people of Christ who are indwelt by the spirit of Christ and who exist for the glory of Christ. Suffering is still suffering. Pain is still painful. Hardship is still hard. Heaviness is still heavy. Tragedy is still tragic. Loss is still loss. But Paul sees those sufferings as not worth comparing to the glory that's coming. He has an entirely different way of thinking because he considers it theologically. He is indwelt by the Spirit. He is a son of God. He is an heir with Christ, and the plan is for suffering unto glory so that Christ may be praised as the firstborn among many brothers. Do you see it? Do you you see it? Amen? He doesn't stop there. Look at verse 35 in your Bible. Chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? See, here will be the lie of your suffering. Jesus doesn't love you, or he loves you less than he used to, because look at what's going on. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? You could just put out in the margin of your Bible, suffering. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, the answer is no to the question. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So how you think and how I think about our sufferings has a lot to do with how you and I are impacted by those sufferings. If we think wrongly, if we think man-centered, if we think of ourselves as the center and God functions for us, then likely we will have bitterness and anger that reside in our souls in our suffering. If we consider it without the gospel being preached into it, as the Apostle Paul does in 16 and 17, then likely we will be so disappointed in our expectations and bitterness is likely to grow in our resentment for what we're going through. No hope will truly exist in our sufferings. If we think of it unbiblically, then we will be like the world around us, merely considering it as something to grin and grit our teeth and bear it. And when necessary, use whatever means to cope to get through it. But the Apostle Paul is doing something different. He is living through it and thinking about it theologically. Maybe you're thinking, I want to do that. I just don't know how to do that. (laughs) Maybe I'm in the middle of the fog right now or the crisis is coming. Let me give you three little encouragements when you need to develop your muscles to think and consider it theologically. Here's my encouragement. Number one, focus on the big rocks theologically. Suffering is not the time to go chase down every theological truth that you can find. It is the time to tie off to the biggest theological truths that anchor your soul. So focus on the big rocks. That's our language around here. The big rocks of theological truth. The ones that are 16 and 17 kind of rocks. 
Secondly, focus on your best inputs. In the fog of suffering, limit the number of voices to those who will bring God's truth, the soothing comfort of God's word and his promises to bear on your soul. Focus on the best inputs. Do not have more and more voices speaking into your suffering. Limit it to those who are best suited to bring God's truth to bear, his promises to come, and his words to comfort your soul through the suffering. And thirdly, focus on the basic disciplines. In suffering at times, it seems frenetic, like we just gotta do stuff, we gotta do stuff. I would just encourage you to focus on the basics that God has given as his way to meet you and to work in you. His word must dwell in you richly. Your prayer and engagement with him relationally must be a very center point of your suffering and the fellowship of God's people in your life, the gathering of the saints, the bread and the cup, the songs sung, the prayers prayed, the fellowship with Christ. Remember, fellowship is relating to Christ with each other. That must be the priority. Do not isolate and do not neglect the basics. Focus on the biggest rocks theologically. Focus on the best inputs and focus on the basic disciplines. And I am confident the Spirit of God will lead us as a family in our collective experience of suffering toward a more collective outcome of suffering because we will consider it theologically. Got it? Tracking with me? Thumbs up if you're with me. We, we together? Okay, good. Let's go on to number two then, and let's get to the second phrase that we find, really the middle of the verse. Number two, when suffering strikes, measure it eternally. This sentence is a measurement sentence. Paul has a perspective that is built in measurements. He does not consider, he does not think, he is convinced that it is not, it is not appropriate for the glory that's coming to be put up against the sufferings that are now. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, like, I mean, Paul must not have suffered very much. And I would just encourage you, you're wrong. He suffered a ton. He suffered more as a Christian for Christ than maybe any, anybody else that you've ever known. He suffered tremendously on a physical level. He suffered incredibly on a relational level. He had all kinds of loss in his life relationally. Suffering was a part of his life at a very high level. So it is all the more important for us to listen in as the Spirit superintends Paul to write this to the church at Rome. He's measuring it differently. This is not the normal way. When suffering's on us, when it comes to our doorstep, when the phone call comes, when suffering hits us, we're not prone to measure it then with eternity in view, but that's exactly what Paul does, and it is absolutely important for us to seek the Spirit's help to do the same. He says the sufferings generally, he's not talking about a particular kind of suffering, that's a gift to us, it's just all the sufferings of this present time. Literally, if we translated this present time, literally, it would say the now time. The presence of the now time, the sufferings of the now time are not worth comparing to the glory of the then time. We're living in the now time. And it's not worth comparing to the then time that's going to be the experience that we share. His measurement is built in eternity. And what is his comparison point? His contrast is built with the glory that is to be revealed. And that may just fly right past you, especially if you've come in in the fog of suffering or with the, the persistent chasing of suffering in your soul. You're just like, that sounds theoretical. That sounds like something that I can't understand. It's very concrete. We will be glorified as Christ has been glorified. Absolutely new bodies. Pastor Jared was right to say it. There will be no more disease. Sickness and sorrow will be gone forever. We will be the inheritors of an eternal kingdom with Christ, a new heaven and a new earth where relationships will all be oriented to Jesus Christ. There will be the removal of sin, gone. Sin in the world around us, just the sinfulness, sin in us and sin toward us, gone. The power of sin has been broken, amen? The penalty of sin has been paid, amen? amen? But in the glory, the presence of sin will be removed. It will not be there. This is concrete. 
This is something that Paul is absolutely convinced of. And it is so overwhelming to his soul that in the very real and significant and awfulness of the sufferings in the now time, he just can't even put it on the same grid as the glory that's coming in the then time. So loved ones, how we relate to suffering determines how then suffering is reshaping us. And if we have not considered it theologically, perhaps it has had a very negative effect upon our lives spiritually. And if we have measured it without eternity, no doubt it is overrunning our souls. In fact, Paul was so convinced of this, he said it in a, another place. I want you to hear this. This is one of my favorite texts in the Bible when I want to quit. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, so we do not quit. We do not lose heart. We don't faint Though our outer self is wasting away. Anybody suffering with your outer self wasting away? Can I get an amen? Paul says our inner self is being renewed day by day. Now listen to this. Listen. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us because we suffer with him so that we're glorified with him. It's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. In other words, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 is that he thinks of his suffering now as very light and momentary. But I assure you, in the experience of our suffering, we do not use those kind of words. It seems incredibly heavy, and it seems like, how long? David would write the Psalms like, how long, Lord? Like, how much longer? I can't handle it. I can't make it. How is Paul able to say it's light and it's momentary? His suffering was immense. It was perpetual. It was ongoing. It never went away because he is measuring it eternally. He sees out there that there is an eternal weight, like so heavy of glory, it's beyond all comparison. You can't measure it. The heaviest heavy is not comparable to the glory heavy that's coming in the awesomeness of the presence of Christ. So if the Spirit would be so kind as we are saints who will suffer, and perhaps you are a saint who is suffering, we must measure our sufferings eternally. You say, well, how do I do it? (laughs) Well, Paul says it in verse 18 of chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians. He says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Just look at what you can't see. I don't know what that means. For the things that are seen are transient. They're here and they're gone. They're here and they're gone. What you can see, what we can see with our eyes physically, here, gone. But the things that are not seen are eternal. He says, through eyes of faith, look at what is true then. And it will affect how you perceive what is true now. The suffering of now time cannot be compared to the glory of then time. And it is only in that measure that we then will benefit as we are intended to benefit and be affected and be reshaped by the sufferings of this present time. So, what you and I measure our sufferings against, how we gauge them, has a lot to do with what they're doing on us and in us. There's two ways that we could mismeasure. Perhaps there's others, but these are the two that I considered for my own soul. The first is a temporal comparison. If you have found yourself comparing your sufferings to the good times, to the old times, to the better times, that's temporal. You've been comparing your suffering to the other times where this suffering wasn't there. If if you get temporal in your comparison, it will rob you of the privilege of the benefit that God intends through the suffering, suffering with him in order that we might be glorified with him. The second faulty measure would be relational comparisons. We just start looking at our suffering and compare it to their suffering, your suffering. Why do you not have anything going on and I have this? Why are you not going through anything and I'm going through all of this? Why is my life like this and your life is like that? That relational comparison is not the measure. That will rob us 
One, of the hope of the gospel in our suffering. Two, of the fellowship that God intends through our suffering. Three, for the outcomes that he will work in the suffering that we experience as his people. Loved ones, we must think theologically and we must measure with eternity as the point of reference. And we'll have an entirely new way of enduring the suffering. That's the second relational connection point because the way we relate determines how we're reshaped by the suffering. I just sense all the heaviness that is in the room and my prayer is for the heaviness in the room and for those who are joining online is that the enormity and the bigness and the eternality of the glory that's coming would so overwhelm our eyes of faith that we would be able with the Apostle Paul to say that we consider these sufferings in the now time not worth comparing to the glory in the then time that will be ours. Amen? The tears will be real, the grief is real, the sorrow is real, and you will never be scolded for it by your God. But the Spirit is in you to lead you through the tears, which he keeps in a bottle, which he in the end will wipe away and end forever. He leads you to relate differently to suffering than if you did not have Christ. And if I did not have Christ. There's a third. It's the last little phrase in the relational connections, and I don't want to miss it. When suffering strikes, number three, experience it collectively. Experience it collectively. Paul is collective. He ends with us. And his point is, is to make sure that the believers in the church at Rome and the Spirit of God's point to make sure the believers at Christ Church in 2024 in the metro of Phoenix are convinced together that there is a mutual experience that we are having in the then time. (laughs) The glory is for everybody. That's what's coming in the then time and we're all going to have the same experience of that glory which then ought to lead us to a collective experience of our common expression here of suffering. Though we will not all suffer the same exact way with the same exact outcome or expressions, we will be a people more and more if, in fact, the Spirit of God uses Romans chapter 8 and text after text after text through this summer to give us the hopeful truths for the darkest days, we will be a people who more and more collectively experience our suffering and collectively hope in the glory, confident expectation of the glory that is coming for us. So he says, this is to be revealed. The glory that is to be revealed. This is a definite, it's coming, it's gonna happen, and it's gonna be revealed. It's not gonna be created. There's not gonna be a day when we get to heaven and and God is just like, okay, boom, I gotta get something done here and get some glory created. The glory's there. It's in the person of the resurrected Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's settled, it's secured, it will be revealed because we have experienced the down payment of it in the Spirit's presence in us, and yet we have not experienced the fullness of it. We are in the already, but the not yet. And as we live here in the middle, we are people living together collectively. Paul writes in the plural. He loves the plural. When he says you, almost everywhere you read the Apostle Paul writing in your Bible and he uses the word you, it's y'all. It's plural. It's all y'all. It's used guys. It's yins if you're from Pittsburgh. It's plural because it's our shared experience. Loved ones, we are missing something if we isolate in our sufferings. On that day when we receive the glory, we're going to be together. Can you imagine that? We're going to look at each other and be like, what? Is this for real right now? Are you kidding me? Look at this glorified body. Are you okay with this? This is unbelievable. So it should be in our weeping 
and our rejoicing in this life, we share it collectively. What? Are you serious? Let's think theologically. Come on. Let's measure it eternally. Come on. Spirit's with us. We're the children of God. We have an inheritance. The plan was always suffering unto glory. We're going to be okay. He's not neglected us. We're not alone. We're together. Amen? Amen. So Paul says weep with those who weep. In fact, Paul says it even more strongly. You want to go to a little field trip? You still got your Bible open? Turn to the right. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to have eyes on these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 3 down through verse 5. Just so you feel how much Paul wanted this to be the way it was for us. This is the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, and verses 3 through 5. Got it? Sounds like you went too far. Go back a couple pages. <laughs> if you made it to Galatians, you went too far. Okay, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. If you wondered where that was in your Bible, there it is. Who comforts us in all our afflictions, don't miss these words, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, he's a sympathetic high priest, so that, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Now, don't miss the word in verse four. There's two words that stand out in our translation. Who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in, what's the next word? Any affliction. Loved ones, listen to me now. Our experience collectively of our sufferings as a category. Suffering that comes because of our choices and actions. Suffering that comes because of the choices and actions of others against us. Suffering because we just live in this messed world that's loaded with sin and its consequence just because we're down here in the nasty now time. That suffering comes with the sweet promise of comfort from God. Now, all the expressions of suffering will not be shared in the room, but the category of suffering will be our common experience. And here's the reality. The comfort that you've received from the truth of God's word, from the promises of God, through the people of God, you can, you can minister that. You can, you can give that away to any affliction in a brother or sister that you meet. Loved ones who are going through the most severe and the most heavy and the most long-term sufferings, please do not push away those who would bring comfort from God's word because they can't appreciate what you're going through. You're right in one sense, but categorically you're wrong. We are all sharing in suffering and God has comforted us in part so that we can deliver the same comforts to each other and they can be applied across all the different expressions of suffering in the category of suffering that is our experience collectively. Isolate and we miss it. The glory will be together and the suffering is intended to be together so that we would be a people who consider this Suffering of this time to not be worth comparing to the glory that's coming in then time that will, in fact, be revealed to us. It's us. So who you and I experience suffering with has a lot to do with how suffering is reshaping our lives. Isolation in suffering is a greenhouse for lies to take root and to bear fruit. I'm not saying that thousands of us all need to relate to everybody who's in a particular suffering moment, but some of us, surely a few of us, need to be involved in the sufferings that are taking place within any one of our church family at any time. This is God's intended purpose for us to experience collectively those sufferings so that in the celebration of experiencing the glory together, we will have been us all the way home. There's fellowship in your suffering. First with Christ, Philippians 3.10, and then with each other as the saints who suffer. Now, some suffering is gonna isolate people. In fact, let me give you two more references. Can you get two more addresses down before we're done taking notes? First Peter chapter five and verse nine. 
1 Peter 5, 9. It's a protection for those of us who are in the suffering and think nobody else is going to understand. Suffering is happening everywhere, and there are others who are walking through or have walked through the same kind of suffering. 1 Peter 5, 9. Don't isolate based on the lie that you're the only one who can appreciate what's happening. It's not true. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. Hebrews 13, 3. The author of Hebrews commends the people of God to not forget those who are in prison. Why is that? Because the saints are suffering persecution and some suffering will actually isolate. So two things happen. One, Peter reminds us that we're not alone and therefore we ought to engage with one another knowing that each other has comfort that has been delivered from God through his word that can be then administered to each other. And secondly, there are going to be situations where we have to go for, after, and with those who are isolated by their sufferings. Perhaps you're feeling that even now as you join in online, that you have been isolated by your sufferings. The heart of the New Testament is for us as a church family to pursue you. We have not forgotten May you receive the comfort that we've received as we deliver it to you. The text message is worth it. The phone call is worth it. The visit is worth it. The letters to the people in prison for the sake of Jesus Christ, it's worth it. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Loved ones, experience it collectively. Consider it theologically. Measure it eternally. And then live in the us. Experience it collectively. And in those relational connections, God will, in fact, do his good reshaping work. Our trials, as Milton said, will bow to his purposes. Amen? And he will sustain us all the way home. All right, we learn in order to live at Christ Church, so let me give you three questions. You take them home with you, and then we'll be done. Number one really is a sole question for those of you who perhaps came today but do not follow Jesus. How does Jesus' suffering shape me? If the suffering of Jesus is only an example of someone suffering well in injustice, you're misunderstanding the good news of the cross. It is that, but it's more. It is an example of suffering, Peter tells us, but it's more. It's a substitution payment for the sin penalty of all who will believe, including you, friend, people from every background and story, every culture and context. Every resume or rap sheet, doesn't matter what's in the back story. Don't clean up, you can't. Don't try to earn your way religiously, you can't. None of us can. Born in sin, cursed with sin, choosing sin, we need a savior who will substitute himself with no sin to pay for of his own, who will pay for our penalty, and he's done it. His name is Jesus, he's the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. He's the eternal son of God, uncreated, who took humanity, was tempted to sin, but didn't, so that he could die in substitution payment. The suffering of Christ, yes, it is an example of suffering, but far more important to your soul is that it is a substitution payment for the wrath of God that must come against your sin. Come with us, confess your sin, and cry out in faith and believe that Jesus is the Messiah and you will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen, church? Come with us, friends. You did not find all the good people who decided to call ourselves saints. You found all the sinners who God set apart through the work of his son, and he calls us saints. Question number two really falls out of it. Church family, how has my suffering sanctified me? I just would encourage you to look back. Often looking back at past grace will encourage us toward faith and future grace. You aren't the same as you used to be, and part of it has been your sufferings. You say, yeah, I know I have gray hair or no hair, I've got wrinkles and bags and I've got a heartache and I have memories that make me cry and I have triggers that set me internally all kinds of weirdness. Yeah, I'm different, all right. Yes, but you are more like your savior too. You love differently, you care differently, you know him differently. He has shaped and molded you to think the way he thinks, to love what he loves and you have been suffering with him and you therefore will be glorified with him. Think about it. Journal it, it's worth it. Perhaps you have a friend who is in the, dip, the depths of suffering right now. You journal for them. You tell them. You've seen God at work. You've seen the way he shaped them. 
Number three, last question, how should others' suffering stir me? Compassion is a key part of our life. We have confidence that God is doing good things through the suffering of his people. Do you know that? Listen, I know verse 28 gets used generally in Romans 8. He's gonna work it together for good. I don't know what he's gonna do, but he's gonna do something good because 28's in my Bible. Yeah, but 29's in your Bible. There's a guaranteed good thing he's gonna do. He's gonna conform us to look more like Christ. That's gonna happen. He may do a bunch of other good things, but he's gonna do that. That's gonna happen. So our compassion for one another leads us to comfort one another because we're stirred by their suffering. We minister and we live on the mission. The world is suffering, loved ones, and you have hope. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. There is no place in our faith for sneering at suffering and saying, I'm glad they finally got what was coming to them. That is not the way of Christ. Even if their suffering is because of their choices, we are those who extend the hope of the gospel. Amen? All right. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. May it be that it has the same outcome among us as God's words renew us. How we relate to suffering determines how we are reshaped by suffering. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this simple sentence from the Apostle Paul that your spirit gave to us and preserved for us so that we would be shaped by it. I pray that you would do your good work now, spirit, through it. For those who are in the suffering, comfort them. For those who are on the cusp of suffering, prepare us. For those who are on the, just the other side of the crucible of suffering, remind us and secure us so that you receive glory through us. And we pray that you would save our friends. Open their eyes to the victory that's been won by Christ for the salvation of their soul. It is your victory, Lord Jesus. You have won. And whatever is taking place, we rejoice to know that on the other side of the suffering of this time is glory with you in the then time. It will be eternal. It will be weighty. And we are longing for it. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and find us faithful in our sufferings for the mission of your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.